Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, just a quick thing, I've got a bunch of like links and stuff in these slides, so I put a, a link to uh, where you can actually see the slides online on the Discord channel, so if you're curious to follow along or anything like that, uh, the slides are there as well. Um, and they'll be there after too, if you wanna go back and look. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jetin, and I'll be talking about continuous integration and continuous deployment for developing audio plugins. So uh, most of this you already know now, but uh, I've, I'm from Denver, I'm a signal processing engineer, uh, and usually I talk about signal processing, but today I'm doing something a little different. Uh, for the last year or so, I was working at Tesla, doing some car audio things there, and now I make plugins. Uh, I've been making a bunch of open source plugins uh, as Chowdhury DSP or Chow DSP for the past few years. Um, so first I wanted to talk a little bit about how I learned about CI and CD, uh, and it actually has to do with this device here. Uh, this is a radio telescope, actually, that is near Penticton, British Columbia in Canada. Uh, and it's used by astrophysicists and cosmologists for a bunch of experiments trying to map the hydrogen content in the universe and uh, trying to look for these things called fast radio bursts, which are a uh, very interesting phenomenon. Uh, but from an engineering standpoint, this device is also a huge technical challenge because it has a raw data rate that's about six and a half terabytes every second. So it's not really... Uh, practical to try to store all of that data. So the project that I used to work on uh, when I worked on this project back in 2017 was to try to build a real-time software pipeline, real-time not on the scale that we're used to in audio, but real-time like over the course of a few minutes to try to process uh, the data coming in from this telescope, decide what is worth saving and what information can be thrown away. And as a software project, this was also kind of challenging technically because you want to be able to update the software pipeline very quickly so that scientists and people who want to run experiments on the telescope can have their code running uh, very quickly and, and can make updates very quickly. But it's also tricky because if your code fails, then that's really bad because you could, use, you could lose a lot of data and potentially ruin some very, very expensive experiments. So the solution that the team there came up with was to use this service called Travis CI. Uh, and they had a very thorough set of unit tests and integration tests and made sure that all of these tests passed before you would deploy new code to run in the pipeline. So this was back in 2017, and I'm sure their process has gotten much more sophisticated since, uh, since, since then. Um, but for me, this was kind of how I discovered CI and CD and came to find that it was something I, I really enjoyed working on. So just a little bit about how this talk will work. I'll talk a little bit about what CI and CD are, uh, about why for making audio plugins these tools can be very useful. Uh, I'll talk about what tools and services are available for uh, setting up continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines. Uh, and then I'll give some examples for how you can do this for plugins. Uh, I'll mostly be talking about plugins, but all of these ideas can be applied to software in general, not just audio software. Uh, and yeah, I think a lot of this, if you've used CI and CD before, might be a little bit of review, but hopefully there's some new ideas for you as well. And if this is all completely new to you, then hopefully uh, you've come to the right place and we'll start from a very, very basic level here. So just to kind of define these, these ideas very briefly, um, for continuous integration, I think of it as if you're trying to make changes to your code base uh, and you're trying to Maybe you have a, a Git repository and you're trying to merge commits uh, either before or after merging. You want to make sure that the changes you're making are not breaking anything. They're not making your code so that it won't compile. They're not causing tests to fail, anything like that. Um, continuous deployment is a little bit different. The idea there is that as you're making changes, your code changes and, and your software is continuously being deployed to users who are actually using it and testing it uh, and there's a lot of different ways that continuous deployment can work uh, for different types of software, so we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. So first, why should we bother with continuous integration? Uh, I'm sure uh, when I got started with this, it was like, oh, this seems like a, a lot of effort, and is it really worth the effort? Like, what, what do I get back for putting in all this effort? So hopefully I can explain that a little bit. So... Let's say you're building a plugin, and I ask you what platforms and what formats do you want your plugin to support? And you say, okay, I want Mac, Windows, and Linux, and I want VST, 
audio unit and maybe LV2 or something, I don't know. Uh, and so I ask, okay, well, does your, plugin does your plugin build and compile for all of these formats and platforms? You might say, well, it builds on my laptop, so yeah. Or you might say, well, I use Juice or iPlug or one of these cross-platform frameworks, so yeah, of course it builds. Uh, or you might say, well, I don't know, I haven't tried. So uh, this is kind of a, a tricky thing when developing plugins because even if your project builds locally, maybe you have a teammate who's on a different type of machine and maybe it doesn't work for them. Or maybe you're trying to build for different processor architectures and you're not sure if your plugin will build across the different architectures. That can be a big problem these days, especially with the ARM Macs if you're trying to support both types of Mac. Maybe you're using a cross-platform framework, but if you're writing C++, it's very easy to write non-portable C++ code. For other languages like Rust and Python or things like that, maybe it's not as big of a deal. I, I'm not as familiar with some of the ins and outs of those languages, but uh, for C++ specifically, uh, you can kind of trap yourself very quickly. So here's a little example uh, I made on the Compiler Explorer where it's just very simple. You have two structs and you're trying to initialize one struct with another. And on the Microsoft compiler, that's totally fine. And on Clang, that's not fine. And I'm sure the C++ experts here can find 30 or 40 more examples like this where it's simple code that works on one compiler and fails on another. So at the end of the day, uh, the reason you should use CI to test your build process is that if you're making changes, one change might introduce one or two errors. That's pretty easy to fix. It's just one or two lines of code that you need to change. But if you let these commits kind of build up and these changes build up, uh, you might run into, okay, you try to make a build and all of a sudden there's 20 or 30 or maybe 200 or 300 errors uh, that you didn't see the last time you tried to build for that platform. And first of all, psychologically, that can be very uh, difficult try to try to tackle, and it's also much more time consuming to try to fix. So the quicker you catch errors, the quicker you catch things that will cause your code to fail, the easier it is to fix them. And I think that's a big part of continuous integration. Uh, it can also be really frustrating for collaborators. Uh, I, I know I've dealt with that where a teammate commits some code and then I pull that code and all of a sudden I can't build anymore. Uh, and even worse, if you're trying to ship your product and all of a sudden your builds are failing, that's really not a place you want to be in. Uh, next, does your plugin validate across all the different formats and platforms? So from the user's perspective, I'm sure if you make plugins, you've gotten emails about this before where, oh, I'm trying to use your plugin in Logic and it fails validation, or I'm trying to use your, your plugin in Reaper and it doesn't show up in the, in the plugin browser. Uh, <laughs> So you can kind of try to validate your plugins with different tools that are out there. So Apple has their audio unit validator. Um, this is a really simple example of how you might run that. Um, I haven't successfully gotten a UVAL to run in a continuous integration pipeline, but uh, I'm still trying. Uh, and then there's also this great tool called Plugin Val, which was presented here at ADC uh, a couple years ago. Um, and Dave Rowland gives a really great explanation of why it's important to validate your plugins and why uh, Plugin Val is a great tool for doing that. Um, one nice thing that I like about Plugin Val is that you can download it onto your computer and use it like any other application, but you can also use it from a script and use it in a CI pipeline using these, uh, this kind of uh, command line interface, which is really handy. So we know our plugin builds. We know our plugin will validate, so when the user tries to pull it into their, their DAW, it will work. But does it actually do what we think it will do? So now we need to test it. Uh, and there's lots of different types of tests. Uh, you can do unit testing, you can do integration testing. Um, maybe you have some regression tests to make sure that your plugin sounds the same as it did a week ago and that you know, no uh, uh, weird bugs have slipped into the actual audio output of your, your plugin. Uh, and maybe you have some performance tests so that you, you make sure you didn't accidentally do something that will make the performance of the plugin 10 times worse or something drastic like that. And there's lots of great frameworks you could use to, uh, to do this. There's a few that I've used, um, and you can also roll your own. It's not too hard from what I've heard. Um, so to kind of recap, what are some things we can do with continuous integration? We can make sure our plugin builds. We can make sure that our plugin will validate. We can run our tests. 
And then, I haven't really talked about this yet, but there's tons of fun little extra things you can do. Uh, you could enforce code formatting, you can run static analysis, uh, maybe you need screenshots for your manual or your website. Uh, you can generate those automatically. Uh, if you want audio examples, again, maybe for your website, you can generate those. Uh, I'm sure there's tons of other fun and creative ideas that people will come up with that I haven't thought of yet. So, yeah, those are just a few uh, fun little things you can do with continuous integration, along with the more important things uh, that are, are really crucial to your development cycle. So now to kind of dig into a little example here, um, I made a very simple plugin that's just a gain knob. Uh, it's made with Juice, and you can build it with either CMake or the Producer, uh, and it supports all of these different formats. Um, and then I made a little example repository that has continuous integration workflows implemented with all of these tools here. Uh, and then I didn't choose to do examples uh, with these services, and I'll explain why in a, in a couple minutes here. But if you actually want to check out the repository, uh, that exists here on GitHub. So yeah, we can look through it. There's instructions for building and all that. Uh, the Azure pipeline is pretty simple here. So if you've never looked at these before, there's kind of an overall structure that you might see repeated often. So you need to give the continuous integration pipeline some reason to run. So uh, this, this pipeline will be triggered anytime you push to either the main or develop branch. Uh, it will be triggered if you're trying to run a PR uh, or a pull request uh, that's targeting the main branch. Uh, then here, we need to give the workflow kind of a build matrix where we tell it what, uh, what type of machines you want to run on. So I want to run on Mac OS, I want to run on Windows, and I want to run on Ubuntu. Um, and then you kind of get this, again, very repetitive thing where you check out your code. Uh, in this case, we have submodules, so we want to check those out as well. Uh, on Linux, we need, to, we need to install some dependencies so that we can compile our plugin. And then with CMake, it's very easy. Uh, you'll see with the producer, it's a little more complicated. So with CMake, uh, we can run our CMake configure step. We can run our build step. Uh, it's nice to use parallel builds if you can. Um, and then I have a little unit test uh, kind of tool that I can run here to make sure that all of my tests run. Uh, and then I've got a similar thing implemented here with GitLab CI and Circle CI. Uh, I'm going to skip over those for now, but you can take a look at them if you're interested. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about the GitHub Actions here. So the, the CMake uh, workflow here is pretty much the equivalent of the Azure Pipelines one that I just showed. Um, so again, we see here's our reasons why we might want to run the pipeline. These are the different operating systems that we want to run on. Uh, here we install our dependencies. We need to install CMake. Uh, we need to check out our code. We need to uh, configure the, uh, run the CMake configuration, run the CMake build. And then here I actually have a script that will download and run plugin val. So uh, we can do that here also. I, I'm only running it on Windows for now, but you could run it on Mac or Linux too. Uh, and then you run your unit tests here. So we can actually see in GitHub what that looks like. So here's, uh, let's look at the Windows run. Um, yeah, so we can see it'll tell you all these things about downloading CMake and whatnot. Uh, the actual build is pretty straightforward, what you might expect, building all these juice things and uh, audio plugin clients. And then for uh, plugin val, you can see the output here. So it finds the plugin, it runs it through all of these tests, and then at the very end, it will tell you that all tests pass. Uh, and then for the unit tests, uh, oh, for some reason, it didn't print the output for Windows. It does it on the other, uh, the other operating systems, but it'll, it'll print it if it fails. Uh, and then the other things with GitHub that uh, we can show you here are uh, a workflow for building with the producer. So uh, this is a little more complicated since you need to build the producer, then resave your juicer file, and then you can actually build your plugin. So that's what we're doing here, where we, uh, for Xcode, we need to run Xcode build for the producer. For Windows, it's MS build. 
Uh, and then for Linux, we can just do make. Uh, so we do that, then we do our resave step here, and then we do our build step here again with the, whatever build tool we want to use for this platform. Uh, so yeah, producer is a little more complicated, but you can still do it. And then finally, I have a little uh, workflow here that enforces uh, a style, code style thing with Clang format. Um, and you can see how that's working here. And then kind of a cool thing here is that when it does Clang formatting, if anything changes, it will actually push those changes back to the repository automatically. So I don't need to worry about uh, if I accidentally don't do my formatting right, it'll just fix it for me. and I don't have to pay too much attention to it. So that's kind of handy. Anyway, yeah, feel free to dig around the example repository and, and see how it's implemented for the other uh, services as well. Cool. Sorry, I'm going to drink some water real quick. So yeah, let's dig into the different tools we have available a little bit more. So the first kind of continuous integration service that I'd ever heard of was this tool called Jenkins, which has been around for quite a long time, and everything around Jenkins is kind of free and open source. Uh, they have all of these, they call them plugins, which are sort of things that you can add to your workflow that other people have developed for you. Um, and it's very well documented, which is nice. Uh, one thing about Jenkins is that it requires self-hosted runners. So the reason why I didn't do a Jenkins uh, pipeline for the example repository is because I don't currently have a self-hosted runner set up. Uh, but basically what, what this means is you need either some machine on your desk that will run the actual continuous integration pipeline, or maybe you have some server like a AWS instance or something like that, uh, which you can use for that purpose instead. Um, so it does take a bit of time and effort to kind of set up these self-hosted runners and, and manage them. Uh, but because of that, it's also very, very flexible. So if you need a ton of flexibility, Jenkins is probably the best option for you. Uh, plus it's free except for whatever it costs to do your self-hosting. Uh, and actually, Akash Murthy will be here on Friday, or I guess online Friday, doing a workshop uh, kind of showing you how to set up a CI pipeline with Jenkins and AWS. So I'm really excited for that. Uh, next is Travis CI, which has also been around for a little while. Uh, and they actually offer remote hosting options. So instead of running this pipeline on a local machine or your own server, like you would with Jenkins, they actually have their own server. And when you run your job, or when you run your CI workflow, it will run on their server. Uh, and one interesting thing is that they claim to be free for open source projects, but uh, I ran into a little issue with this last year. So uh, they changed their pricing model last year so that if you're an open source project, you get a limited number of credits. And once you run out of credits, then you need to email them and ask for more. Uh, and so when they made this change, I think I ran out of credits in like a week. And then uh, I emailed them, and they didn't get, get back to me for like two months. So uh, I still don't have any more credits, which is why I didn't make an example workflow uh, with Travis uh, in the example repository there. Um, but the remote, ho the remote hosting is very convenient, especially for me. Uh, I've moved like three times in the past year, so it's very hard for me to have a physical machine on my desk. And I don't particularly want to pay for AWS or any of that. But uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> so their, their plans are kind of based on concurrency. So you can pay a certain amount to get one concurrent job or two or five, um, and then Mac jobs are kind of separate. Uh, they also have enterprise plans, which offer self-hosting and other, uh, other fancy things. Uh, there's also Azure pipelines, which Microsoft runs. Uh, and so what you'll see is that most of these services offer some balance of remote hosting or self-hosting and some kind of free option, especially for open source projects. Uh, so with Azure Pipelines, uh, their pricing is kind of very flexible depending on exactly what you need. So you tell them exactly what you need and they tell you exactly how much you need to pay them per month. Uh, it seems to be very easy to switch between their remote hosting and their self-hosting, which is nice. And the uh, Surge Synthesizer actually uses them uh, for their open source support. Uh, so it's, it's very free for open source projects. So that's nice. Uh, Circle CI is also a great option. So uh, they have a lot of the same kind of 
services and options that the other ones do. Uh, one kind of nice advantage to CircleCI is that they have a lot of different platforms that you can actually run on. So for Linux jobs, you can actually run on an ARM machine. So if you need to test on ARM hardware, that's very nice. Uh, they also support Docker containers, which is handy. Um, their pricing seems reasonably, reasonably cheap. Uh, and they also have these things called orbs, which are sort of these reusable containers and sets of commands that you can reuse, uh, which makes your life a lot easier as, as you set up the pipeline. Because if you need something uh, that you might use more than once, you don't need to repeat it. You can just make it an orb and then reuse it as many times as you need. Uh, GitLab CI is also another maybe slightly newer option. Um, so if you already have your code in a GitLab repository, then that's probably a little bit easier for you. Um, one thing about them is that their remote hosted runners are only for Linux right now. Um, but it is very flexible and they have kind of a nicely integrated continuous deployment support. So you can deploy to a, Git, a GitLab release in your repository very easily. And then finally, here's GitHub Actions, which is what I use for most of my projects nowadays. Uh, it's run by GitHub, but really it's run by Microsoft because they own GitHub. Uh, so it's probably using the same exact servers and the same data centers that Azure Pipelines is using. Uh, so similar to CircleCI with their orbs, in GitHub Actions we have these things called actions, which are these sort of reusable parts of your workflow that are, are very handy. Um, and another nice thing is that it's very tightly integrated with GitHub. So you can do things like making releases or labeling your pull requests or responding to issues automatically all through a CI workflow, which is pretty nice. Cool, so I was gonna show a few more kind of examples of how this can work in a more real world situation. So uh, when I say in the wild, really what I mean is through open source projects, because uh, we can actually see them and uh, you know, look at what they're doing in a little bit more depth. So I have some of my own plugins, which I'll walk you through kind of my CI strategy there. Uh, and then I'll show kind of how the Surge Synthesizer team does their continuous integration uh, since they have a very sophisticated and uh, well thought out model there. So for my plugins, I kind of have three sort of layers to my continuous integration and continuous deployment. So I have a few libraries that I reuse between multiple plugins that I have. Uh, so I have an internal, or I have a dedicated CI pipeline for each of those libraries. Uh, and then I have a CI pipeline for each plugin that I work on. And then I also have a, like one global continuous deployment pipeline that runs for all of the plugins. So as an example of a library, this is just a normal C++ library, not related to juice or anything like that. Doesn't even need to be used for plugins necessarily. Uh, and for this uh, project, I have a few CI pipelines. So one is for running tests, so unit tests and integration tests. I have a pipeline for running very rough and not very accurate benchmarks. Uh, I have some example projects and some example uh, uh, things that you can build in the repository. So I run a, a pipeline for that too to make sure that they build correctly and run correctly. And then I have a similar thing that you saw for code formatting. And then I actually generate the API documentation from a, a continuous integration pipeline as well. So I can show you that a little bit here. Yeah, so the uh, auto formatting is basically the same as what you've already seen. Uh, the tests here are kind of nice. So uh, in the build matrix here, it's a little more complicated because I support several different libraries that you can use. So it needs a lot more uh, kind of options in the build matrix. But then from there, it's basically what you've seen before. You just do a CMake configure, a CMake build, and then you run the tests. Uh, and if we look at what it actually looks like, uh, <clears throat> In the end result here, um, I don't know, let's look at this one. Uh, yeah, so you can actually see all of the, the test output here. Uh, and if any of those fail, then I need to rewrite my code or do something different. Uh, so it's very nice because I have, this library has a lot of reused code. Uh, so if I break something in one place, if I'm testing with a different library or on a different operating system, it's very easy to break things. So it's nice to have uh, this kind of comprehensive testing across the different platforms and things like that. Uh, 
And then the other nice thing here is the API documentation. So uh, I have a little bit of uh, Doxygen comments and all of that. So I just need to install Doxygen, and then I have a make file for making the documentation, and then I can actually push them to uh, my little website there. And then at the end of the day, it gets automatically generated for me every time I make changes to the code. Uh, so that new, new documentation gets generated automatically. So the one here uh, was generated on November 7th, uh, even though I haven't touched the documentation stuff in, I don't know, probably three or four months now. Uh, so that's really handy for me, since I don't like doing that stuff manually. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, here's a juice module. So this one's a little bit trickier because uh, it depends on juice, so I need to kind of download juice separately uh, and do things a little bit differently. Um, so with this library, uh, here, let me close the old stuff. Uh, with this library, when I run my tests, uh, the way that I need to do it is I need to, uh, when I check out my code, I need to check it out to a specific directory. And then I need to clone juice and some other repositories that I depend on. And then I can actually uh, build and run my tests. So it's a little bit more kind of manually Defined, it's not as easy as just running CMake uh, a couple times, but beyond that, it's, it's not too difficult. Um, and then the other handy thing about uh, this project is that I've got a test coverage uh, workflow defined. So uh, whenever I make changes, I can see how my test coverage has improved or, or maybe, uh, hopefully not, uh, kind of slipped. Uh, <laughs> it's taking a, a minute to load here, but uh, yeah, it kind of shows a nice visualization of what parts of the code are being tested and, and what parts are uh, maybe lagging behind a little bit. Um, maybe it'll show up here. Yeah, so you can kind of see, like, okay, that file doesn't have, you know, maybe doesn't have quite enough tests, but this file is doing pretty good. So, yeah, different things like that that are kind of handy, uh, especially since my team is very small, it's just me, so it's nice to have these tools that they give me feedback that maybe in a, in a real world situation other developers would give me. Uh, and then finally, for actually making a plugin, uh, I have pipelines to test that everything build, that all my unit tests are good, that plugin validation works. So this is kind of exactly what we saw with the example repository. Uh, and then recently I've been messing around with trying to do static analysis with Clang Tidy. Um, haven't gotten to a place where I'm totally happy with that yet, but I'm still working on it. Uh, and then I also make my user manual uh, through a CI pipeline, so I can show you guys that here. Um, so the user manual is all uh, kind of set up with LaTeX. So uh, where is it here? Yeah, so the user manual here, uh, really all I need to do is check out the code, make sure that LaTeX is installed, and then run my make script to create the, the manual and then it gets automatically deployed to this little website where I can look at it. So yeah, that's, uh, that's very handy for me. And then finally, I have a continuous deployment pipeline which makes, they call them nightly builds, but really it runs every hour. Uh, <laughs> so I, I used to run it from a little, at a little Raspberry Pi on my desk that wasn't doing anything. So I set it up to run this script. So every hour it will ping all of my plugin repositories and check if the latest commit has moved. And if the, if the latest commit has moved, then it will ping GitHub Actions to clone that repository, make a full build, a, a release build, and all of that, uh, make installers, sign the installers, all of that. And then it will actually uh, kind of go back to the script, and then the script will update my website with new links for the nightly builds. So uh, I can show you guys that here. Uh, yeah, so the way it's set up is that for each plugin, uh, maybe we'll look at this one. Uh, I have a, a metadata file which has the name of the plugin, the repository, what was the latest commit the last time that we checked for commits, and then what branch to use to make the nightly builds. Uh, I'm not really using the tag field right now, but maybe at some point I will. Uh, and then, oh, that's not where I wanted to click, but okay. Uh, and then I've also got these scripts that will actually go through the, uh, the build process and make the installers and all of that. So in the actual CI pipeline, all I need to do is check for, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I should have shown you guys this. Uh, 
Well, you might see here in the commit message, it will say update nightlies and then the name of the plugin. So the, the CI pipeline will actually look for which plugins to update, run the script for that one, and then at the end, upload all of the installers to, uh, to my website. And then on the website here, you can actually see all of the plugins and all of the nightly installers that you might want to download. And then it will tell you uh, the date when that build was created. So you know if it's the new one or if it's maybe an older one. Uh, but yeah, so this has been really handy for me. And I'll talk about that more in a second here. So finally, I wanted to talk about the Surge synthesizer. So uh, Surge is a really great open source project. If you're looking for an open source project to contribute to, uh, they're a really nice community. A uh, really wonderful sort of group of developers and users working together to make this software. Um, and they have a very nice sort of CI pipeline set up. So they use Azure pipelines. So if you're looking for kind of a different look than GitHub Actions, uh, you can check out how they do it. Uh, they have very sort of comprehensive build checks. So they check that uh, Mac, Windows, Linux, all of those plugin platforms and all of these different compilers work. So uh, regardless of what compiler you're using or what platform you want, uh, you can be pretty confident that it's going to build if you just clone the repository and try to build it. Uh, they have code quality checks. They have unit tests. Uh, and actually, I forgot this. I was just reminded the other day, but they have Python bindings for their, uh, their plugins. So they have a, another CI check that will build the Python bindings and do some tests for that as well. So it's really, really comprehensive. Uh, and then they have a nightly build pipeline as well, which actually runs even faster than mine. So uh, <laughs> as, as soon as you make a commit uh, and all of the other CI checks pass, it will trigger the nightly build pipeline. Uh, it will generate release builds, installers, sign and notarize everything. Uh, and then it creates a GitHub release so that uh, you can actually go to this GitHub repository here. Uh, it updates their website, and it posts a message to their Discord. So if you're a nightly build user, you can just subscribe to that Discord channel and get a buzz on your phone every time there's a new build for you to test. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you really want to, I, I wouldn't do that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so to kind of talk a little bit more about continuous deployment, uh, in general, how do we automatically deploy software? So uh, I use Gmail, and every once in a while I log into Gmail, and it looks a little different than last time. So Google kind of deploys things continuously without even telling me. Uh, and for Gmail, that's fine, but for desktop software, that might be a little bit more difficult to do and also a little bit more difficult to explain to users. So, for example, uh, I use VS Code, and VS Code will automatically check for updates and ask me if I want to update. And if I'm using the nightly build of VS Code, it will alert me about nightly builds. So that's kind of nice. Um, uh, there's also a sort of nightly build model that's more generally used by open source projects often where there's just a link on their website that says, hey, uh, here's the nightly build if you want to test it. And uh, I think for making plugins, nightly builds can be kind of very, very useful. Um, but it depends on having testers. So if you don't have testers who will test your plugin somewhat regularly, then maybe it's not worth the effort. Um, but if you do have those testers, it's really nice because, especially if you're working on a new feature and you have a tester or two that is really invested in that feature, you can kind of iterate very quickly with them. Like, say, here, I made this new change. They test it out. And even within a couple hours, get back to you and say, OK, this is better. This is worse. And for iterating quickly like that, it's very, very nice. Uh, or if you accidentally broke something that your tests didn't catch, which hopefully doesn't happen, but if it does, then uh, getting quick bug reports from users is really handy in that way as well. And it's also nice for your own testing. Like if I want to make a song and I want to use the latest version of my plugin, but I don't want to wait 10 minutes for it to compile, uh, I can just download the nightly installer, install the plugin, and then I can go ahead and actually make music and not have to wait for my code compiler to do anything. And also, if you're running an open source project, nightly builds are really, really nice. So uh, Paul, who's one of, the, one of the main developers for the Surge Synth team, uh, gave me this quote about how nightly builds have been really, really handy for them in kind of developing their community and improving the quality of their software. So I'll let you read that for a sec. Cool. 
Yeah, so to kind of recap what we've talked about today, uh, we went over what are CI and CD, how can they be useful for developing audio plugins, what are some of the tools that are available, uh, and then for open source projects, we have some examples of how uh, CI and CD are currently being used for making plugin development a little bit easier and uh, aiding developers and testers as well. Uh, there's a few more advanced concepts I didn't really talk about today, uh, but are definitely worth learning about if you're really interested in this stuff. Um, so setting up self-hosted runners is really useful. Uh, if you're worried about your build times, especially if you're paying for your minutes because maybe you're not running an open source project, then doing things like caching uh, is really handy for improving your build times. Uh, and oftentimes, if your builds have uh, what you might call a build artifact, where it's some something that you want to manage after your pipeline has finished, uh, you don't just want it to be deleted with uh, the rest of your pipeline once it's finished, then you might need to manage that build artifact, and there's different strategies for doing that. Uh, and then finally, here's some other resources. So uh, Maxwell Polak, who's actually here, uh, has a really, really nice repository where he shows some of these more advanced things like making GitHub releases and uh, doing caching and things like that. So definitely worth checking that out. Uh, and as always, the Surge Synthesizer is really, really nice for kind of seeing how they do things, not just with CI, just with plugin development in general. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, yeah, so finally, thanks everyone for coming. And here's uh, some links if you want to contact me for any reason. Uh, yeah, Raj. Uh, from Graham Kim, do you have any tests where the expectations are audio files? If yes, how do you deal with outputs which aren't bit exact with an expectation but still sound the same to a human ear? Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't currently have anything uh, that does anything like that, but it is something I've been thinking about. Um, one idea that I had was, let's say you have like a reference audio file uh, and you want to generate some output and compare it to your reference, uh, it's very hard to get something that's bit exact just because of differences in processors and things like that. Um, but one thing you can do is try to maybe uh, flip the polarity and null the two uh, signals. And maybe it's not bit exact, but you could get to like minus 90 dB or something reasonable like that. Um, and I think it, it won't be perfect, but it'll catch very obvious uh, failures. Uh, or if you, if you have a more sort of specific signal, maybe it's just a sine wave, uh, then there's other things you can do, like uh, maybe take an FFT and analyze that. Um, but th that's very, it, it depends on the signal that you're working with. Okay, there are some additional questions here. Um, are there some best practices uh, to test audio I.O.? Uh, not to my knowledge. That's a very tricky thing because uh, most of the virtual machines that your CI workflow will run on may not actually have an audio thread or, or may not have any way to sort of pipe audio into your plugin and out of your plugin. Um, the way that I have things set up, and, and you can see this in, uh, maybe not in the example repository, but in some other places, is I make a little sort of, I call it a headless utility that is connected to the plugin, so I could write a little wrapper there that can take in an audio file, do some processing, and then either analyze it or generate an output WAV file uh, and do things like that. But it's not really I.O. in the sense of like how a plugin would really process sound, I guess. Okay, um, next question. Vincent writes, how do you manage project and build version numbers? For example, do nightly builds increase your project version number in Producer? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. How do you manage project and build version numbers? For example, do nightly builds increase your project version number in Producer? Yeah, so right now, especially with nightly builds, this is something I'm still trying to deal with. So. Um, the build version in, in the, uh, the code that's being compiled isn't changing in any way from build to build, uh, unless I change it manually in one of my commits. Uh, but something that Surge does, which is something that I've been looking at doing, is they have a, a way of including the first like six characters of the commit hash in their version. Um, and so that way your version will always be something new whenever you have a new commit. Um, and so that's, that's a really nice way of doing things that I'm probably going to try to borrow from them. OK. 
Okay. Uh, well, we have another one here. You wrote a lot um, of uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment options in the presentation. Um, I guess by options um, might mean uh, the, the tools uh, that you presented. Can these options be categorized to the type of CI, CD task that you are trying to do? For example, if, if is one vendor uh, better over another one for specific continuous integration, continuous deployment tasks? Because it's confusing to have so many options. Uh, where, where do you start? Yeah, it is, it is confusing to have so many options. I think maybe it, it's not as good to categorize by task, but more by uh, sort of what platforms they offer. So uh, for me, I need, well, I, I want free builds for Mac, Windows, and Linux, so I can't really use Circle CI because their Mac builds cost money. Uh, and so, sort of things like that, where it's like, OK, if, if you need Linux ARM builds, then Circle CI is maybe your only option. Uh, so I think it's a lot more about sort of the different platforms and, and hardware that these tools support uh, that, that makes it easier to kind of narrow down uh, what, what will work for you and what won't. OK. And the last question that came uh, online is, what about, what, what about base protection integration? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is something I've been dealing with recently. Um, so if you're using kind of the iLock sort of uh, pace protection where, where you need to have your iLock plugged into the computer to actually sign or wrap your build, uh, then it's, you, you can't really do that over a continuous integration pipeline if it's hosted remotely or in a server because obviously you can't plug your iLock into some server and you know, Seattle or something. Uh, if you're actually running it on like a self-hosted machine that's on your desk, then I think it, it could work where you have your iLock plugged in there. Um, something that I've been doing recently is uh, for one of my plugins, I've been starting to add AAX support. And so I, make, I have a script to make my builds locally. And then if I want them to be added to the nightly installer, then I can push them to a server. And then the nightly build script will download them from the server and package them in with the installer. But it's not a solution I really like, so I'll keep working on that. <laughs> OK. Uh, we don't have any additional questions online. Uh, we have a couple more minutes in case there is one last question from the, from the audience. Do you test your GUI, graphic user interface? Since I imagine a change could like break a plugin and it still builds and validates. Yeah, so right now I don't have sort of end-to-end -end UI tests. Um, I have tests, especially in my Juice module library, for the different UI components, but they're more unit tests and not really like sort of, I guess, interaction tests or end-to-end -end tests. Uh, that is something I've been looking at adding. Uh, there was the presentation here yesterday sort of about that, which gave me some really cool ideas. Uh, but another thing I was looking at actually is, um, so with the Juice accessibility support, uh, it's possible to kind of interact with the UI externally. So uh, I think I'm going to wait until I add accessibility support, and then I'll add that on top. So I, I saw an example with the Surge folks actually, where they added accessibility support recently, or they're in, in the progress of adding it, in the process of adding it, and uh, the developer there, Paul, actually figured out a way to automate tests with a Python script uh, for doing UI interactions. So I need to dig into that a little bit more, how he's doing that. And that is something I, I'd like to add, yeah.